Buongiorno a tutti e bentornati. Io sono Gregorio Di Leo, co-founder di Wide insieme a Elena Ermacora e queste sono le nostre conversazioni necessarie. Oggi siamo arrivati alla quinta puntata. La prima puntata abbiamo parlato di complessità, abbiamo dato il titolo del presente, la seconda abbiamo parlato di vita. L'abbiamo fatto con un poeta, con Franco Arminio e Morag McGill, una nostra esperta di comportamento organizzativo. La terza puntata abbiamo parlato della parola. Con, l'abbiamo fatto con il direttore di Wired, Federico Ferrazza e Andrea De Carlo, scrittore. E la quarta puntata invece abbiamo avuto Francesca Di Carrobbio, CEO di Hermes, Oscar Di Montigny, manager di Banca Mediolanum e scrittore e um, innovatore. E l'abbiamo poi fatto con um, il CEO di Mosaic on Shoes, Mass- Massimiliano, Massimiliano Sambri. Oggi siamo alla quinta puntata e il titolo che abbiamo dato a questa puntata è La Forma. La nostra conversazione sarà una conversazione internazionale, abbiamo, abbiamo qui due ospiti straordinari di livello veramente mondiale, lo facciamo con Meg Pagani, e Meg benvenuta e grazie di essere qui con noi. Grazie, grazie a voi per l'invito. Ti introduco velocemente ma poi ovviamente lascio a te presentarti. Uh, Meg è stata nominata dal World Economic Forum World Sha- eh, Global Shaper, è stata nominata da Forbes eh, co- tra i 30 innovatori Global Shaper Under 30 Social Entrepreneur ed è la founder di Impact On, che è una, te- una startup tecnologica di cui poi ci racconterà. E lo facciamo poi con Alec Ross. Buongiorno Alec, hi Alec. Yeah. Ciao Gregorio. We will switch to English in a few moments, but I will introduce yourself. Alec è uno scrittore, è uno scrittore di fama mondiale, ha scritto un libro che è stato tradotto in più di 24 lingue, e si chiama The Industries of the Future, è board di Amplo, che è un'azienda di corporate venture capital, e ha curato la campagna di Obama, è stato, appunto, ha partecipato alla campagna elettorale di Obama, ma soprattutto è stato scelto da Hillary Clinton come Senior Innovation Advisor, quindi durante il suo mandato come segretaria di Stato. Quindi oggi abbiamo due eh, persone veramente di livello internazionale che, con le quali entreremo in conversazione e il titolo che abbiamo voluto dare a questa conversazione è La Forma. Abbiamo deciso di, par- di parlare di forma perché la forma che la nostra società assume non è data. La forma la si decide insieme, la si negozia, la si contratta, la, la, la si crea tutti quanti insieme grazie alle idee che mettiamo in circolo. Le idee che mettiamo in circolo condizionano la nostra società e allora... Qual è la forma che la nostra società può assumere? Quale può avere anche un po' nel futuro? Cosa, si, cosa può nascere da questo momento? Forse ci sono già delle idee che sono in giro. Ne parliamo con due esperti di innovazione. E adesso passiamo all'inglese, quindi ci entriamo in un mood internazionale. Io saluto tutti coloro i quali ci seguono sia su Facebook sia su YouTube. L'invito è sempre lo stesso, è quello di eh, scriverci dei messaggi, è quello di farci le domande in italiano e in inglese, io le raccoglierò dal web e creiamo questo spazio di condivisione, questo spazio di scambio e cerchiamo di seminare nuove idee per il futuro. Allora io comincio subito con uh, una domanda per Meg, benvenuta, hi Meg, and it's really, it's really a great honor, a great pleasure to have you here, I know you are in Lisbon right now, And we will really love to know more about your work. And, you know, the idea is behind everything you do as a social entrepreneur, as a tech entrepreneur. Thank you. I, I promise we will speak uh, slow because I tend to go very fast when I speak in English. I know the audience here today is mostly Italian. So again, thank you so much for those who are participating in this conversation. Uh, thanks, Gregorio, for the introduction. Uh, definitely, like to share more about my work, uh, I would start saying that uh, most people, when I talk about you know what we do with impact investment, with impact entrepreneur, uh, my background is uh, commonly believed to be in finance. And instead, I would love to actually share that my background is in art. That I studied most my, I spent my supposed, like most of my early life career study more how we can use innovations that also include language and, and how we manage information to create the, the changes that we want to do in society. And, and back to what you said, Gregorio, about what I do today. I founded an organization at the end of 2017 that is called impacton.org, uh, really with one question in mind, which was, and still is, if we really want to create a planet first economy, what does it take? Because a lot of the processes and a lot of the the rules that now dominate or shape our society are definitely not thought to be uh, the ones that can lead a planet-first economy, a planet-first ecosystem. 
And, and one of the concepts really that I was especially interested about uh, or in was, okay, once, once we create incredible innovations, once we invested so much time and resources into cracking the code of something that is either not working or creating damage, et cetera, then what happens? What we normally think about is the famous concept of scaling, scaling a technology, scaling an innovation, scaling impact, depending on the sector of, of your reference, there is always this idea that the innovation that matters are the ones that can scale, which I definitely agree in. But scaling is not a, like a very binary type of game. Depending on a project and depending on the innovations and the most human ones especially are the ones that are not generally entirely based only on digital technology. So it's not something that can scale the same way Slack can scale or Facebook can scale. You need to look at the models in which we make sure that what works, the innovations that we invest our most brilliant minds in actually can get to 100% of the people or the places that need it. And when I started to look into this, I remember uh, reading especially a study from Bridge Bank Group out of San Francisco, California, one of the organizations that really study how the innovations that can change the life of billions scale or not. And I remember this, uh, this information, like this specific detail, which is even the best impact organizations normally in their life cycle as organizations, as models, reach more or less 0.5 to 1% of the global need for what they have created. And I remember thinking that with the information that we have today and with the technology that we have today, really sharing or scaling what works could be dealt with completely differently. And that's what Impact On is about. We work with either social entrepreneurs or impact-driven organizations or with much larger organizations like Caritas, UNICEF, you name it, for profit, non-profit, that understood that they have a gem that they have shaped over the years or found over the years a gem that they understand that is needed in more places. And they're interested in exploring ways to really scale that gem or spread that gem beyond the limits that normally are the ones that we know in organizations, which are the overheads, the cost, how really what works in an innovation can, can go beyond that. So we offer a specific methodology in a set of digital tools for depending on the organization for what is called best practice sharing or knowledge sharing or project scaling. It really depends on the language of each, of each entity, but it's all, if you want, brought together by the same mission. We work with the organizations that understand that this planet first economy is gonna ask of us to really reinvent how we make what we want to create and the value they want to create back of what we were mentioning, but also how we make sure that it gets everywhere it's needed. And how, and I think that this is gonna be a crucial point, especially for the times that we're seeing right now. The organizations and the individuals that we want to be part of the solutions are the ones that will understand this opportunity to reinvent and will want to look at new technologies, new innovations, new decentralized systems to really scale what works. And this is what we do in a nutshell. So you, you kind of promote an idea innovation is based on diffusion versus scale in a certain way. Can you just, you know, tell us more about the, the, the diffusion. Then I have, I have a question, of course, for Alec. But I think that's a key concept that is really, you know, kind of mind blowing in a certain way. Yes. Um, so scaling, as we think about it, or normally when we think about it in images, we somehow see these dots in the middle and some of these branches or arrows that really reach everywhere. And and we normally think that uh, scaling a project is also means to scale the organization. And most of the time it's not necessarily like that. We can find a very fine create shape, a very good gem, a very good program or project. And scaling can means, for example, to scale via affiliation, via social franchising or franchising, via licensing. From the legal perspective, from the technological perspective and from the process, it's, um, there is a lot of grace between you know, staying in one place and going everywhere you're needed. And, and really to define that scope in all its options, the most common one is franchising, right? We can think about, the famous chains, it can be Starbucks, it can be McDonald's. But the reality is that for the best innovations, these models don't work. Because especially with the ones around in impact investment or sustainability, the more the models that have a higher component that is cultural and human or sociological, they need more flexibility and adaptation than a franchising normally allows. Think about it. You enter in a Starbucks anywhere in the world. And if you, you know, if you take your coffee at any moment, you could be in New York, London, Beijing, it, it's the same. It's exactly the same. So when it comes to models in sustainable development or in social impact, especially, you normally need more adaptation than what is allowed 
from franchising. So that scope between scale as we know it, so I, I created something, so I, my organization will raise funds and I will go to every city and do it myself or find local talents, but I will do it. It's normally very slow and very expensive. And it can work for some industries and companies, but you become slower than what you could do and could become today with the technologies innovation we have at hand. And it's utterly incompatible with some of the models that create a lot of value, maybe not as much profit. It is profitable, can be sustainable, but you don't have those margins that allow you to scale in that way. So what do you do? Is your solution ready to be lost in the shadow of times? or should we find better ways to scale it? And in this sense, we use the word diffusion or spreading to really represent these sort of decentralized systems of scaling what works in a decentralized way, in a way that is also more inclusive and welcoming of local talents that are the ones that probably can tell you how something can work on local level. So for what I understood about impact on, for example, you create blueprint or at least you work through the model as a, of a blueprint. But yes. I think that's that's a, it's really important for our future discussion. So if you can explain us about blueprints, so that 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 could be very useful useful for us to understand the model. Yes. So we call it blueprints, but really with Italian audiences like this one, Italian lovers, Italian for origin, we call it recipes. Um, if you think about it, uh, there is a fundamental difference between describing a project to be known, like in a report or in an article, and describing a project to be done. And then in the describing a project to be done, it's a very, very high difference between um, instructions. So you do this this way because I say so, or because this is it, it's how it works, for example, in Lisbon, to tell you or to use what we call outcome-oriented language. To make you an example, uh, it's, if, it's different to tell you to take the bottle and put it on the shelf with your right hand, and it, you, you need to take three seconds because in Lisbon, that's how it works. That's an instruction. I'm telling you exactly how you need to do it because I am the one with the whole knowledge to do it. Different is if I tell you the outcome is that the bottle gets on the shelf. In Lisbon, we use the, the right hand and it took three seconds for these reasons. How can you maximize this performance and the impact for the context where you are? If you leave that space for non-defined and if you create the right balance between guidance, top down evidently, and bottom up adoption, that's when you create these formulas where a blueprint can guide you to figure out what is the goal that we're trying to recreate, but really engaging with the local talents on how to recreate it, sometimes even better. We see some replicators actually adopting these blueprints or these models, and the models of replication perform better and then the one in the original context. It's normal. It's, it is different markets, it's different cultures, different responsiveness, but especially it's a different way to involve talents in scaling what works because you're allowing them to be part of the conversation in instead of just you know listeners and executors. Thank you, Meg. That was just to have an overview of, of on, on your work, and we, we're gonna of course uh, you know know more during our conversation. And thank thanks thanks Alec to be here. Really for us, it's an incredible honor. And it's uh, from from your perspective. Uh, I mean, if we have to kind of. Uh, make a line to, to understand what's the path we are in right now. Which are the ideas that shaped our reality up to today? And what type of change, let's say, is calling us right now? So, I mean, this is, for example, this is an amazing example what Meg is bringing us on the table, like how we can see innovation in a different, totally different way. We are not speaking anymore, let's say, in this case about, you know, uh, scaling, we are speaking about diffusion. We take something that is working somewhere and we try to replicate, adapt to somewhere else. And it's a, it's a, a world that is free, it's a, uh, without borders. So it's a it's a world where you know innovation ideas can can move around. But sometimes it, it feels that we are still stuck in a whole system, and we still think the world in a really old way. So, what do you think are the ideas that shaped the, our, you know, our reality till today? And what can, what is the future? And how, let's say, what, what's it's the change is calling us right now? Sure. Well, first, thank you for uh, having me here today. It's it, the honor is all mine. Let me point to two, the two ideas, the two concepts, the two systems that I think have been the most powerful over the last thirty years and then relate them specifically to what Meg was discussing. Uh, and those are capitalism and globalization. 
And so it's interesting talking about um, things like um, scale versus diffusion. We're talking about operating within a capitalist system. Uh, and I am one of those who believes that at this particular moment, our, our form of capitalism is being challenged. Capitalism isn't uh, just one thing, it's a dynamic system. And I, I think that the opportunity for us, both examining the dominant ideas of the last three decades, but also looking forward to the 2020s and saying, you know, what should we be examining? What should we think, be thinking about? For me, capitalism is at the top of it. So let me first say that I'm a capitalist. You know, I'm one of those who believe that in capitalist societies, we all benefit unequally, uh, but in socialist societies, everybody suffers equally. I would rather benefit unequally than suffer equally. And so when we talk about innovation, First, let's define innovation. The way that I define innovation, I talk about creating new products or processes that enable the realization of our, of our continued future. You know, it's the creation of new products or processes that, that allow for the continuous realization of the future. And so I think that you know, capitalism over the last couple decades, unfortunately, has gone from really... Uh, being rooted in creating goods, creating things that increase uh, wealth and well-being to something that's more ephemeral, something that just exists more on paper and which we don't always necessarily feel. Uh, you know, I think back to a movie from about 30, 35 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, mo a movie, Wall Street, where Michael Douglas plays the Wall Street uh, investor, Gordon Gecko, And he's describing what he does. And Gordon Gecko says, I create nothing. I make nothing. I am nothing. I am the illusion that has become the reality. And yet he is the captain of finance making hundreds of millions of dollars. And so what's interesting to me, part of what I think COVID-19 has actually revealed is for all of the wealth that we've created and for all the innovation that we've benefited from, we've lost a little bit of our connection to building things uh, that we can see and feel and which tangibly and materially increase our well being, as opposed to innovations which make us wealthier uh, on paper. And so when I think about one idea that has most shaped the most recent years that I think is really an examination, it's capitalism. And the question is, how do we improve our capitalism? How can we go from a capitalism that's rooted more in scale than in diffusion? How can we go from a process of innovation that's really about how can we raise the next level of financing to how can we build something that has a material impact on people's well-being? And the second idea that I would point to is this one of globalization. Now, right now, interestingly, the conventional wisdom, you know, in my community of sort of public intellectuals, people who uh, are going online or going on TV, they are saying this is, we are going to be reversing globalization. Um, we are going to go back to uh, more nationalism, regionalism, and localism. And I think that there may be a moment of that, but I, I but I believe that those of us in the younger generations, while we want to have a real connection to our community, we also do want a more borderless world. And a more borderless world comes with promise and peril. It can enable, it can better enable a virus to move from China into Europe and to the United States. But a truly frictionless globalization, I think, would also allow us to work together more collaboratively and to solve the problem uh, across the Pacific Ocean and across the Atlantic Ocean. And so I think that in addition to our capitalism as an idea being very heavily scrutinized at this moment, I think the other one that's gonna be very heavily scrutinized at this moment is our globalization. And do we go back um, to the villaggio mentality or do we embrace a more global mentality? And I, for one, most of my peers, again, are saying, oh, no, we all need, a, you know, 
to become more self-reliant. Um, but I actually think that reliance is going to be rooted in embracing the best of a more global world while understanding its threats. So to your question, capitalism and globalization are the two that stick out. And starting from here, I mean, what do you think is the, what type of change is calling us, let's say right now? So mm-hmm. if we have to, que- I mean, I know you don't like to be, you know, to be like a guru or like to, to you know, to see in the right. future, but what is, you know, what is the, what is the, the future, what, what the future is asking us? What, 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 what is the path at least, I mean, what we can really understand right now about what is going on? What, what the well, lesson we can learn at least? Well, sure. I think there are a couple things. I mean, the first thing is, uh, I think we've been a little bit lazy, popigro, um, about taking on, you know, the big challenges in the world. We've known about the danger of a coronavirus pandemic for more than 10 years, um, and yet we failed to address it. Um, we've known about the challenges of climate change now for decades, and we're we're doing a little bit, but not a lot to address it. One thing that I hope, again, brought around really by this virus is we do recognize that some of these threats, like the threat of a pandemic or a threat of climate change, they aren't just theoretical. It's not a, th- it's not a hypothetical based on a theoretical based on a maybe. It's real and it can affect our lives. So one of the things that I think is calling us is to say, all right, let's have the discipline to address the big challenges in our society, like climate change. In a weird way, I hope that the virus helps us make, helps focus us more on climate change because it proves that horrible things can happen. It also proves that we can make adjustments in our lives. I mean, who would have thought people like Americans and Italians who are animali sociali, you know, we don't like, you know, we have the anti-quarantine personalities, right? But we're doing it. Restiamo a casa. And, you know, it does show that in the face of, you know, these big menaces, these big threats, we can change our behaviors. And so I, I think that we're, we are in part being called um, to take on the big challenges. The second thing that I would say is for me, I'll speak personally, but for me, this, uh, this is almost a call to, n- to not waste so much time. Let's not waste so much time. I mean, it's interesting for many of us working at home, we found out, oh my gosh, I can get a lot done in three or four hours. You know, I can get as much done in three hours of real work as I did at the office in eight hours because there were meetings and you'd go get a coffee and you'd take the bus to work and all these things. And so I do, I especially think that as you stay at home, um, it makes you reflective about time. And I have the feeling that the other thing that is calling us to is to think more about time, how we can respect time time more, how we can make better use of time so that when we are being rec- doing something recreational, it's recreational. When it's work, it's work. So the second thing I'm really thinking a lot about is time. So take the big challenge, let's say, take the big challenges and like not waste time. It's like, it's, it's a, the, the, where the, let's say the, where the future, what are the new, the new space that is opening, opening to us right now? I, I switch just a second to Italian. Io saluto tutti quelli, tutti quelli che ci stanno seguendo su Facebook e su YouTube e vi invito a condividere soprattutto su Facebook il link in maniera tale che tante più persone si possano aggiungere a questa conversazione. Vi invito a fare delle domande, ne vedo già alcune, alcune, alcune nella chat e faccio invece, continuiamo la nostra conversazione con, uh, con Meg. And uh, my question for you, Meg, and like of course then from here we can just kind of joining join the discussion also with Alec is how should how can we rethink the idea of value I mean I think one of the main question is the different for example the difference between price and value it's like there is a famous quote about Oscar Wilde say that the, a lot of people knows the price of everything and the value of nothing so so 
from from your perspective, from an entrepreneurial an entrepreneurial perspective, and of course we need to think about value. Um, you have a company, you have an organization, but what's the value do you want to create? What's the metric of your success, for example? How you measure your success? And definitely all very relevant questions. Uh, I actually uh, feel absolutely aligned with some of the things that Alec touched on, which is this sort of existing tensions because there is an existing narrative. So there is an existing force between, are we gonna go more global? Are we gonna go more local? It's gonna be first more local then more global. And I absolutely agree in thinking that it might, we might have a phase in which we have this, like this, um, necessity and this uh, tendency to go back to the local. In the same way, really, when we look at innovations and the creation of value, many models are looking at circular economy today, which is not new. It's not going like necessarily forward because we need to go forward. We actually, for many of the best circular economy or regenerative models actually are studying the things that ancestral communities have been doing for a lot of time. And, and in the same way, I would say that in answer, like answering to your questions that I think the conversation around value are going to be shifting in a very, in a very important way. Also, because we need to start understanding what, what is it to create value and what is it to preserve value. Back to the climate change uh, conversation, it's two very different ways of, of approaching value. Um, in capitalism, creation of value for profit, creation of value for who? The value for our clients might be undoubtable, but it can be done in a very extractive process, which is actually creating a lot of damage for the environment and society. I'm not sharing anything new here, but it's all a conversation on value. I think in our, um, in our conversation the other day, I mentioned also this um, concept that I heard in an interview that really stuck with me. We know what's the value of a whale on a, on a ship of China or whoever really, and how much it can be sold for. Can we define the value of a, a live whale that is contributing to the ecosystem that we want so much to preserve and we need to be healthy for us to have healthy fishery and so forth. So I think that value really becomes systemic. And I think that one of the reasons why I, I enjoy very much this sector that I, that I serve, which is technology, innovation, but impact as well, or sustainable development, is because, again, circular economy is an example. Uh, in the circular economy models, you see that some of the technologies that we're applying there today are the translation for what is called others' way of knowing. That again, some communities in the world have been practicing sometimes for thousands of years, that we suddenly feel we need to be back to being the, the students, the young Padawan, uh, instead of being the Yodas, the ones that teach and say how things are done. In the same way, for example, in terms of value in social impact, sometimes you see that you have two models, some that create value by providing services or products and their value even economically as a sustainable business or sustainable um, organization is based on that. Others that are less known, but for me, a lot more interesting are the ones that create value by reducing the cost of something. And it's very interesting when you see this because it also becomes a little bit of a land of policy. Social impact bonds, for example, are one of the financial formats or financial tools that we know that are based on this, on this concept. And we still struggle to measure it. We still, we call it impact measurement. Um, I, I agree and disagree with this approach because value, I think, can be, as you said perfectly, measured in many ways. Your KPI for success can be very different from mine or Alex ones, but they're all valid when it comes, um, you know, for example, to wellness, we all know we, the three of us want to be healthy. What happens when our KPI for success are good for us, but very bad for the environment or good for us, but very bad for the next country or good for us or very bad for the will that we so much want to sell because we know its value. I think that it's, um, it's a very interesting, very triggering conversation. I would love to promise you that we're going to solve it today. I think we, I'm not at least equipped to solve it. I would love, uh, and I think we, a lot can be done with our three brains together and, for the, and with the ones that are listening. Uh, but I think that this is what I'm seeing, right? models that look at the value that can be created or preserved, value in creating something or saving or you know, creating savings for the public, saving for the private sector. Uh, and this idea of creating value for who? Can we redefine and reshape the conversation where something is not valuable if it's not designed to serve us as a whole, the planet as an organism? An organism is not alive if it's not 100% functioning. 
And even if some cells in our body are dying, it's all connected to the value that it has for us in the same way winter serves spring. I think our capitalism, as Alec perfectly said, needs probably to get back to these maybe basic, maybe very simple concepts, but um, there is a very deep wisdom in really looking at values in a more holistic way, in a more integrative way. Uh, as it was said before, looking at the best that each of us can provide, making sure that we don't override our neighbor. But if you have, for, for example, to consider impact on, so your, your company, how would you, uh, how would you measure success? So for, it's a very good question. In fact, Impacton, for example, many people tell us, so how many projects do you have on the platform and on your system? And I'm like, that is not that many. Like we don't, we, for example, a KPI for success that is very common in our repository of projects is the amount of projects. The reality is that, for example, for us, we actually turn away most of the projects, not because they're not good, but because either they haven't proven enough the, the equation that they want to say that they solved, they cracked, or it's not solid enough the evidence that the impact that they have detected can actually be recreated in more context, not by themselves necessarily, but by others. So for as our KPI for success, when we decide to take on board a project, if it's under impact on, so mostly impact driven organizations is of course evidence of the impact, the model must be um, what we call regenerative. To make you an example, uh, there is many projects that solve things with a linear model. Uh, very binary. Um, there is many examples and it definitely will not do any names, but there is projects, for example, that park um, tank of water with water filters, for example, in a village in Uganda, providing access to water. It's definitely true that a village now can drink. In the moment in which the tank is broken, in the moment in which those filters are, are out, that village is back to ground zero. Nothing changed. No skill was created, no local value that is possible to be grown on its own was created, and you have not created an autonomy. You have created what in a relationship, for example, between two individuals, we would call a toxic relationship. It's a depending relationship where there is someone that creates this sort of toxicity, something that from our current economic model, we know very well, even inter-countries. Um, so those models we don't work on. For, for us, those models can be extremely profitable and extremely known. Uh, but they do not serve what we see as the need for the future of the economy and the future for the planet. And the other big KPI, of course, for us is the context adaptation. So we take on board those innovations that we know have some percentage of adaptability for which the magic, if you want, they created in the first place. And normally when, when, we, when clients look for us, they already had some replications, either in one country or in few countries, but they understand that the overheads and the cost of scaling as usual it's just not getting them to as far as the model can go. So we always look at components, for example, of KPIs for adaptation. Um, if that formula somehow, again, the tank, the tank is exactly the same in every city you place it. Um, the best transformation and the most profound ones uh, that really create long lasting value normally involve processes of transformation, personal transformation, skill, growth, sometimes healing, if we look more at the wellness industry, uh, we look for those components to choose the projects and we look at those components also because that's what is going to maximize the impact in the moment in which you put it online because it means that at the same time, thanks to this, that technology, information technology, thousands of people at the same time can start validating that model for their own context without you needing to have a conversation with each one of them about always normally the same things or creating this sort of, again, depending, depending mechanisms. So for us, another KPI is in how many places this is needed, in how many people potentially can have this conversation and start finding their own way to sing these songs or their own way to you know, cook this recipe. How many variation of this that maximize the value for the local context? Because back to value, value is always about, again, where do you create them for who? Sometimes uh, vegetarian lasagna might not feel very attractive for the three of us, but for vegetarians, it's very fundamental as an adaptation. It's the same thing. And it might sound simplistic, but I have like thousands of examples of more technological, less technological example where we forget that in these adaptations, we create the highest value. Thank you, Meg. Thank you. And the same question for you, for you, Alec, it's like you have a, two, these two souls, I would say. I mean, one is more kind of governmental and the other one is more, you know, you, you are in the board of a venture capital firm. 
-hmm. So, I mean, what's your idea from these two sides, you know, from a governmental side and for, for the co co corporate venture capital side, what, what, what's your idea about value in, in these in this two, in this, this life, aspect of your life? Sure. So the way I think about it in many respects is first speaking from the venture capital standpoint and, you know, look, I have a venture capital fund and we have, you know, almost half a billion dollars under management. So we're, you know, normal sized, I guess, by American standards, but we'd be, we, we would be very big by European standards. And we want to make as much money as possible. Like that's our goal. Our goal is to maximize return on capital for our investors and for you us. capitalist you that's are a right capitalist. i am a capitalist i want to make as much money as possible in this respect um but what's interesting is the community that i live in right now value is just the bottom line so something that produces 18 percent return has more value than something that pr produces 17 percent return and something with 17 percent return produces more value than something with a 16 percent return now, I'm going to be overly optimistic for a second because I think only optimists change the world. Pessimists never change the world. They don't. So I'm going to choose to be optimistic right now at this very pessimistic moment. What I hope, again, going back to the circumstances of the virus, is that I hope, I know not all venture capitalists will change. I know not on, all entrepreneurs will change. In the, and you know, in the US right now, we really measure the success of an entrepreneur by how many millions or billions did they make. What I hope is that, again, going back to the beginning of our conversation, talking about you know, the, the, the creation of value on paper versus in real life, I hope that the concept of value goes from being less rooted in numbers uh, and more rooted in tangible things that we can feel or that we can see or that uh, improve people's lives. So again, speaking as an investor, you know, I hope that more of the people in my community invest in things, not just because it's going to be 18% of a return over 17% of a return, but because what is created because of that investment is actually more important to humanity. Um, and I think that that can be done within a capitalist system. For government, uh, I think, you know, this is a case where I'm going to be very, very critical. I think that a lot of I, the higher you go in government, the higher you go in government, uh, and I've been at the very top of it, um, the more government is viewed as like a football pitch for politics. And this is certainly true in Italy. But I think the virus has reminded all of us, hey, this isn't a game, you know, Cinque Stelle contro PD contro the La Lega, you know, it's not, it's not a game. After the election, there's work to be done. And now we are learning uh, that when government works well, uh, you get a better outcome. Look at, look at the outcome in South Korea and in Singapore um, with containing the virus versus the outcome in the United States, for example. And so what I hope that the concept of value in government is, is that we stop measuring value in terms of popularity and in just in terms of what is the percentage of support and start measuring more value in what did you accomplish? What was the product? Not are you popular, but what did you create? Um, and, and I feel like when you look into history, this proves true. The people who are most popular, when you look back over history, were not necessarily always those that were most popular in the moment because they did difficult things. But what they did is they were willing to become less popular to do things that would create more value over a long time. And so from a governmental perspective, so from a capitalist investor perspective, I hope we shift a little bit the definition of value from going just, not just being financial, but making something that also matters. And from a governmental perspective, I think that we need to shift the concept of value to from popularity to outcome. What did that person actually do?
that's I mean uh, something we really hope <laughs> to also in Italy. And but what what, what is uh, your I mean you you spend uh, many years uh, as you say at the at the top of you know politics. Let's say like supporting or like advising. What are the the key learning you are now you know uh, from from that environment from that experience? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you are still involved. Uh, that, that would be my one one of my questions. What are the key sure. learnings that you are now that you you you, you the, your key learnings about uh, from yeah, that so, that experience? I mean, I'll give you three. Um, number one, the work matters. Um, in in the U.S., I won't speak about Italy, but in the U.S., being in politics or being in government is viewed as being not as important as being an entrepreneur. You know, being a CEO is a lot more respected than being a senator or something like this. But what I see is that for most companies, most companies are not creating things that really reshape the world in a meaningful way, but people at the top of government do. So my key learning, number one, is that the work really matters. I mean, the work that I did affected whether people lived or died. Um, and so it matters. Uh, the second key learning I would have is that um, it's interesting, we need to change incentives a little bit in government. So in the marketplace, there's competition to make money. But the view is that not that there's a finite amount of money and everybody's competing for the same money. Um, so one entrepreneur being successful does not necessarily uh, make somebody else want them to become less successful. But in, in government and in politics, it's different. Where instead of money, it's power. And power is viewed as finite. So if somebody else has some, that means you don't have it. And so I think we need to think about incentives around power a little bit differently. Um, because what you see is oftentimes you, the competition and the conversations more often than not are about how to get power and how to take somebody's power than how to use the power, right? You hire pe you, you elect people to, to exercise power, not to, to try to accumulate more. So I think the incentives are really bad oftentimes in government and politics. And then the third thing that I would say is um, we actually need to open up our government and our politics to more innovators, to more people who aren't necessarily political animals or who ever wanted to work in government. But I actually think, particularly among, you know, in, in La Nuova Generazione, you know, young people, we need for young people who are innovators, who think about things differently, who understand the future, um, to get positions of power in government. Um, to bring new perspectives and new solutions. Because oftentimes, I mean, right now in the US, the final three people running for president were all 75 years or old or older. It was Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, and Donald Trump. And they're all old white men, right? Um, similarly, in Italy, a lot of the time, a lot of the big players were the same big players from the 1980s and the 1990s. And I do think that we do need to create more place, not just for a new generation, but also not just a new generation of political animals and political actors, but a new generation of people who may not want to spend their life in politics or in government, but will do it for one year or two years or four years. Um, and then they'll go back to business or they'll go back to academia. So, but we need to create more open space and participation for diverse and younger perspectives. That's the third thing that I would say. You know, the, the reason why we are making this conversation is we, because we want to bring Meg in Italy and run for, you know, as a prime minister. It's funny, I heard this before and I'm so much identifying myself in what Alex just shared, like not a political animal at all. So maybe in that type of government, whenever we create it or someone else create it, maybe. Otherwise I really don't see it possible. But can I mean you know uh, all this situation is bringing you know new uh, uh, a new idea of like how government is important how how have a really you know well run uh, state is important and and 
I mean, we were speaking about value. We were speaking about also, you know, how ideas can shape. But can this be only an inside out process? It's something that we, I mean, people like, you know, people need to behave in a better way or people need to really want it. So from, a, from an entrepreneurial perspective, it's like, what, how, what are the conditions would help you? Or like, what are the conditions that can help you like do better your ideas, you, you, your positive ideas, I would say, this idea of circularity, regenerative value, or something that's really kind of, you know, switch. What, what, is, the, what is the change is needed from, a, from, from, from the environment, I would say, from the condition? Wow, how much time do you have? Mm -hmm. um, I would like I would say on top of my mind as well, like building on everything we said today. Um, you know, I'm I'm, I'm Italian. Uh, I'm a very tall blonde giraffe, not very Italian looking, but I'm Italian, and and I and I've been living in enough places to tell you that of course context matters a lot, and so does our narratives. Like as we said the incentives was just mentioned the incentives we have for example in the political world or the government world the incentives we set with our ideas of success our ideas of what's valuable and our ideas of what happiness even is drive our behaviors um behavioral economics is one of the fields that really ex explore this to the detail about how a minimum change in incentives around the same mechanism can completely change how people behave around it and it's funny when these type of things start to be applied, for example, playing around with faith narratives, America and Italy being incredibly big in that. In our governments, we have this very strong reference of narratives that come from the faith driven system of beliefs, for example. And I'm not by any chance of saying they, they're wrong or they shouldn't exist, not at all. But until we really look that the conditions that shape our reality are way more systemic and way more holistic than we think. And so should be our systems that we navigate. As Ali perfectly said, now we have like government here and then private sector here. And the third sector and the second economy, the sustainable economy is there as like the puppy of the biggest economy. Until we will really change this perspective and we start to shape societies around that, it's gonna be very hard. We fight, as Ali perfectly said, we fight for a very it, you know, cake. We think that um, competition should be the main drive for an entrepreneur to be successful. We do not consider successful, uh, for example, entrepreneurs that don't do exits or that are not incredibly profitable or incredibly famous. We have very little stories of, of entrepreneurs that are incredibly successful and absolutely unknown. Yeah, it's very cultural. So the question that you're asking me, I think it runs on so many levels and I would say that the best conditions, for example, as Italian could start with redefining our capacity and opportunity to make mistakes. We come from a culture where making a mistakes or failing very much in contrast with, for example, the US culture, it's absolutely paralyzing. If, you, if we put it on top that the people that are allowed to speak, and I'm not gonna play the feminist card here, but it's most of the time a white male and above a certain age, like younger people in Italy are not that considered as, for example, in, in the US, which, where we almost have the opposite problem. If you're not 22 and you're an entrepreneur, you basically have like 22 and it's successful. And then you have the IPO, nothing in the middle is valuable almost in terms of narratives. The age, the gender, who is supposed to, where is the change going to come from? Like there is this feminist race, where is the light going to come from? Normally it's from the margins. And where are we gonna, where are we gonna do, like what are we gonna, when are we gonna set up the, the, the roots for those margins to actually be part of the conversation? Um, same thing with a failure. If we don't allow to fail, how, how on earth can we say that we know what we're, what we're doing? Or that a person that is leading and knows what it's doing. We're athletes, Greg, you and I, maybe Alec as well, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Our coaches broke us open. The best, the best of us really made us make the worst mistakes so that we could learn ourselves, our body, our own performance, our own style as players. Um, I'm an ex-professional volleyball player for, for those who uh, might have not connected yet the blonde giraffe and, and volleyball. And, and making mistakes is, for example, a fundamental part that at least in Italy and in many other places, I lived in Latin America for five years, is still like this dogma. 
at this paralyzing force that is on top of, you know, not, not everybody is supposed to be talking or doing things. And on top of that, if you want to do something, it's better for you not to make mistakes or you're out. I think these are the um, two of the many um, that I at least come to mind right now. Yeah, let me, I, I know we're running out of time, but let me reinforce. Go, go, um, go. Very strongly, one of the points that Meg made, just with some data. Um, I'm 48 years old, and my fund, we have 18 companies, all right? All 18 CEOs are younger than me. All 18 CEOs in my portfolio companies, and these are people we've given hundreds of millions of dollars. And when I go to Silicon Valley, or I go everywhere. Again, for I think I'm young. I think I'm young, but I'm always the oldest person there. I'm the old guy with the checkbook, 48 years old. When I go to Italy, I'm always the youngest person at the table, always the youngest person. Um, and this is a big problem. And if there is a young person, it's usually somebody's son or daughter. Like it's usually somebody who's, oh, it's the father who started the company. Oh, you know, you always recognize that last name, right? You're like, oh yeah, Emil Zio. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I get it. I get it. This is a, this is a huge problem. This is a huge problem. And then the second thing I want to re reinforce, because it's just so important, what Meg said, il fallimento. You know, the idea that, you know, if you fail in Italy, it's like you've disgraced your family and you can't get another <laughs> job. You're you know, you're out. And in the U.S., it's the opposite. So Apple, Steve Jobs was fired. Um, before he created all of these things. There's this little company, maybe some people have heard of called Google. Um, you know, the CEO of Google who made it a huge success, Eric Schmidt. Before that, he was the CEO of a company called Novell, which failed. Barack Obama, before he was elected United States Senator, he got his ass kicked running for Congress from a nobody. So there is, you know, look, I am, I am so critical of the United States right now. And, you know, our president is unequable. It's he, he's, he is, he is, he's a, he's the worst human being on planet. There are 7.5 billion people in the world. And I think Donald Trump might be the worst of all the 7.5 billion. That's um, a yeah, yeah. I, yes. Um, so I'm very critical of the United States, but if you're asking about some of the systemic changes, the two things that Meg said were critical. I would add a third. Um, since we began this conversation in many respects, talking about innovation and what is oftentimes necessary for innovation is entrepreneurship. Uh, it's too difficult to be an entrepreneur in Italy. You know, I always say Franco Bolo, Franco Bolo, Franco Bolo, Avocato, Avocato. You know, it's, it's, it's the... So I do think that if we want to change society outside of government, and I do believe that you can change society with innovation and entrepreneurship, if you're going to do that, then you've got to systemically remove the barriers to being an entrepreneur. Um, mm. It's very, and in Europe, it's wildly varied too. There are some countries in Europe where like in Estonia, it, you can incorporate a company in one hour. Um, and it, it varies place to place. In Italy, it's one of the most difficult places uh, to be an entrepreneur. So I will say, if you want to change, reshape society, if you want to reshape the world, if you want to reshape Italy from outside of government, and you want to do so with ideas, with innovation, with entrepreneurship, then you have to sy systematically reduce those barriers to entrepreneurship. Any suggestion for us? So, I mean, uh, Alec, you're, because you, I know you're coming yeah. to Italy. So you're moving to Italy. Yes. You, you will be teaching a Bologna, a Bologna business school, I guess, yes. or Bologna University. Yep. So what's your plan about that? How, what are you going to teach us? We, not, uh -huh. Joking, but not joking. No, it's bureaucracy. Um, you know, the bureaucracy is crushing um, in Italy. It's too much. You know, it's like the process is the point you know it's it takes months to do things that should take hours i see meg laughing i mean it literally takes weeks and months and thousands of euros 
to do things that you should be able to do online in hours. And then when people complain about the economy or they complain, oh, you know, they moved, you know, to Slovenia or, oh, they did that. Then it's like, yeah, well, there are reasons for that. And so one very concrete thing, I would say 30%, 30% de la burocracia has got to go away. Um, some of these processes exist only for the employment of the people in charge of those processes. Um, and I don't hate people in government. I, I was in government, but I was saying this goes back to this idea of service and of value. You know, the value has to be in what you're creating, not, you know, the job you have controlling a process. Um, so that's one thing that I would say, you know, I, I do think regu some regulation is important, but it's a sliding scale. You can have too much or too little. And I think that the talent exists in Italy, but the opportunity does not. And part of what you have to do is make it easier for the talent to find the opportunity. And that means re removing systematic barriers. I go through some questions we have on uh, on internet. Some 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 are not questions, but are kind of uh, affirmazioni. They are sentences. But Luca Magni writes: We don't seem to have the ability to develop good politicians in Italy nowadays. The best resources in our country keep very far from politics, and they are kept far away from power by present politician politician parties. Um, so unfortunately, always Luca say, unfortunately, failure in poor economy has very different outcome than in rich one. Neopotism was typical of Europe, but the Kennedy, the Bush, the Clinton and the Trump demonstrate the US have catched us up. Um, I think that, that <laughs> that's, in, that, that, that's in politics, not in business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, that's the one thing we were talking about the economy. Um, of my companies, for example, the, the 18 CEOs, I don't know anything about any of their parents. I don't know who Lozio is. And so the nepotism exists, the social nepotism exists and political nepotism exists, but it's not economic nepotism like it is in Europe. So it's, mm. a, it's an important difference in this respect. But I mean, really, uh, from, is there any battle, I mean, battle it probably is the wrong word, but like how, and that can also kind of bring us to the closing of our conversation is from where do we start? I mean, we are picturing, I mean, that's the big, the, 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 really, the, what I really enjoy about the conversation is that we, we little by little, we picture a kind of a new, re, not a new reality, but let's say a possible future of young, people making mistakes, uh, working to create an environment and economy that is regenerative, is circular, where we invest in things that have a different, have a value from, a, you know, a, from a wider perspective. Um, from where do we start? What, what can be, I mean, is, is there a battle to, to you know, there is, there is some fight to do. What, what, from where do we start? Because in some time, I mean, we feel kind of stuck. I mean, I can I can say here in Italy. I mean, the virus, the virus is now kind of uh, waking us up. But then, but then, from where do we start? Because I mean, the risk is like that everything goes back. We are speaking about a world where you know maybe we need to be faster. We need to be more open. We need to 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 take off the bureauc bureaucracy, and we need to try to create value from a you know a wider. Of a wider environment, something that is bigger. But where do we start? So in practical words, so if you, if you both of us, let's say, day day two tomorrow, you're gonna go out from your house only if you uh, have to make something like practical. If like if you have a clear thing to do, what is what would be your suggestion? I'll leave the last word to Meg, but I'll just make if I were to start. If I were Italian, I would start with entrepreneurship. I mean, starting a company. So many of the greatest entrepreneurs in the United States, whether you like them or not, you know, people like Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, you know, Elon Musk, a lot of these people, they started their companies without venture capital. You know, they were teenagers or in their 20s. They just had an idea. Um, but what they had was the courage 
to turn their ideas into products and into companies. And, you know, I, I would say where you start is leaving the fear in the background. If we can make it through the virus, then what I hope is that we come out of it with less fear than more fear for the future. And, in, and if somebody has a big idea, instead of listing all of the reasons why it won't work or they can't start a company, list the reasons why it can work and then go do it. So, you think, so your message is uh, entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is the starting point, let's say, for the new way of creating value. Yes. Um, What's about what's about you, Meg? I mean, where where where, where are you gonna start? Especially, I mean, we're waiting for you here in Italy. We're waiting to vote you to run as a as a prime minister. Uh, while we wait for this, what what do we do? Uh, that's gonna be a long waiting. So let's figure out. We do a lot of things. Um. So on top of what Alex said, that I couldn't agree more. Um. He talks about, you know, acting in spite of fears. Um. Uh, definitely uh, encourage and, and entrepreneurship, I definitely agree. I would add to that two things. One, let's remember, as we said many times here, that probably a different world can only exist if we understand these other opportunities and other ways of knowing and other ways of doing things. We also need to remember, like many of our Renaissance and Renascimento artists used to tell us that we shape outside the reality that we have inside. If we believe something is possible or impossible, it's just for ourselves to figure out internally first to then be able to do it outside. It's the same thing with fear. We still carry it within, but we do believe we can do something about it and we do something about it. And that's how an entrepreneur is born. And it can be with a young, as you said, Gregorio, that I consider non anagraphically young, young in spirit, the ones that understand that we are alive every day we choose to be. And the, and the second one connected to the courage of taking action, action is really back to uh, my beloved Italian roots, which is the concept of Andaria Bottega. Uh, in, in, a, in a sort of interview or video from, from a friend of mine, Alex Davenia, he uh, reminded the concept of when we, when we want to look for our vocation, for our contribution to the world, we used to go and take the courage to say it so that someone could point us in the direction of the master we want to learn from, or the bottega where we would create what we want to shape. And then eventually our master would challenge us, like the coaches we were talking about it, and we would be, become who we are once we also overcome our masters. So maybe, again, especially for those that don't necessarily want to serve from an entrepreneurship role, which is perfectly fine, as much as the ones that don't want to serve the public as politicians only and are dreaming of Alec creating the opportunity for us to contribute to government without being politicians or under a party. It's the same thing. Maybe you're not ready to create something from zero. Maybe we can look for those other ways of knowing, asking out loud if someone knows which master can we go for getting trained or for getting inspiration, that master that is going to challenge us to believe something more about ourselves and something more about what we have to give to be part of that solution that is gonna be is gonna be about each single one of us that's for sure so those are the things that i would i would leave here for us to spend the rest of the life on thank you meg thank you meg so much i'll try to summarize all some some of the things that we 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 talked i mean i know i like to speak italian so I go, i'm gonna go in italian eh, è, è stata una, una conversazione ricca di, di spunti è, è, ed è bello vedere come alla fine si, si ritorni attraverso tutte le cose che ci siamo detti anche le altre conversazioni che abbiamo vissuto e anche, anche il lavoro che stiamo facendo in questo momento con le conversazioni antifragili che sono state come posso dire, lanciate da Giorgio Di Tullio con, eh, con, con Findustria Macerata l'idea che sempre di più oggi e probabilmente ci sia una dimensione imprenditoriale da ripensare e che l'Italia sempre di più abbia bisogno di persone che abbiano non soltanto la voglia di pensare al futuro ma di creare il futuro attraverso delle imprese. E questa idea di valore, di... You, you would be hold in Italy then, uh, when, when you come in Italy, Alec, yes. uh, che, che, che i giovani possano essere il motore Ecco, sembra una banalità, però probabilmente no. io, io ho 38 anni, mi prendono ancora per un ragazzino, forse lo sono, anche Meg lo è, <ride> però eh, cioè nel senso adesso sono diventato padre, nel senso mm. oh, faccio l'imprenditore, però 
c'è un aspetto importante ed è la questione anagrafica di quanto effettivamente siamo pronti come paese, come cultura ad accettare il fatto che non bisogna avere 70, 80, 90 anni per poter no, sedere a alcuni tavoli, poter prendere decisioni, che il futuro è comunque di coloro i quali hanno l'energia, come diceva Meg, probabilmente non è una questione anagrafica e lo dicevamo anche rispetto ad alcune conversazioni credo che sia quella con Giorgio che avevamo fatto sul tema della complessità non è tanto una questione anagrafica non è necessariamente una questione anagrafica è proprio una questione di spirito e di capacità di innovazione e di eh, capacità anche di seguire quelli che sono le, i diversi flussi che il futuro sta aprendo in questo momento io mi ero chiuso una domanda io mi ero tenuto un'ultima domanda ma in realtà no, ci sono una serie di principi eh, che oggi eh, app appartengono al mondo dell'innovazione. Alcuni principi sono l'idea della scalabilità contro la diffusione, quello di cui abbiamo parlato con Meg, l'idea che una soluzione che ha funzionato in un paese possa essere trasportata attraverso un blueprint, attraverso un esempio, attraverso un esempio virtuoso da un'altra parte senza eh, pesantezza. L'idea delle, della linearità verso l'idea della circolarità è un altro tema che abbiamo trattato. Ci sono nuovi sistemi economici, nuovi modelli di business che possono nascere ma che richiedono una visione diversa del che cosa vuol dire creare valore per chi. Meg, credo che tu l'abbia raccontato benissimo con l'idea che non bisogna soltanto creare valore ma il valore può essere anche preservato, che preservare sia un valore. E allora tutto il tema della rigenerazione, dell'idea dell'economia come un qualche cosa che rigenera in questo appunto la circular economy è uno dei sicuramente uno dei, dei modelli a cui prestare attenzione e il tema della proprietà per esempio in, uh, verso in, di, di contro, contro l'accesso cioè quanto oggi noi invece necessariamente di possedere delle cose possiamo invece pagare per accedere e quindi entrare all'interno di un'economia che sia sempre più um, shared quindi eh, condivisa e poi ecco l'ultima domanda che vi faccio How much the economy, I mean, will be driven in the future by tech and by, and, or by humans and what does it mean? I mean, what does it mean to, to really think about, uh, to bring together technology and humanity? I mean, what the, how you picture it? I mean, how, how we can really think about bringing together? Because now, I mean, we, are, we have been really a lot of technology driven. Innovation have been technology driven. And I know you, Halek, have a, you know, a strong points about how you know, technology can be embedded with humans. You also write, wrote a book about that. So last question is, uh, it's gonna be about technology, it's gonna be about humans, how we can bring them together. Yeah, so I think that Uh, the technology that we've developed over the, lo the last 25 years um, has helped us communicate more efficiently and effectively. It's helped us access information more efficiently and effectively. Um, but, you know, a lot of us are walking around, you know, with, you know, things in front of our faces all of the time, or, you know, we're always connected into these machines right now. My hope is that the 2020s fuse humanism and technology and you know going back to the question of value um that we create things that put humans first and that meet some of our emotional more human social needs in some new and different ways and i actually this is makes me very optimistic about italy because if you think about italy italy has always done a good job of bringing together the art and science of bringing together art and science, bringing together technology and humanismo. Um, so this is one reason why I'm very, why I'm more optimistic that Italy will be more of a participant in the next 10 years of innovation than it has been in the last 10 years of innovation. Thank you, Alec. Last word to Meg. I'm going to be very quick on this one. Um, I believe that we shape that technology. Technology is an extension, like money, of who we are. We build systems with technology that we believe are like completely separated, but really we shape technology because we shape them. So we shape them in on top of what we consider valuable, what we consider success, what we consider of um, something to be uh, looked for. And I think that the technology we shaped, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, speak of um, human being that was still evaluating more quantity than quality and so many other systems that we are shaping. And I think that um, future 
the future is not going to be more or less technology, more or less human. I think that, as Ali perfectly said, we're going to we're going to hopefully understand that these are means and technologies that are meant to serve us as a collective. And uh, the technology, like any other system we shape, is going to be going in that direction. If we will reevaluate that that is the direction we want to go and what does what that takes of us, what different beliefs, what different narratives, what different values we want to put at the center of the technologies that we shape. Thank you, Meg. Allora, grazie ancora. La prossima conversazione che abbiamo, che avremo, sarà con Patrizio Paoletti e Simona Gonella e sarà sul tema dell'educazione. L'educazione non intesa come trasferimento di informazioni o creazione di competenze, ma l'educazione intesa come eh, capacità di coltivare il meglio degli esseri umani. Parleremo quindi di intelligenza, intelligenze diverse, intelligenze multiple, intelligenza delle emozioni, intelligenza del cuore. E cosa vuol dire riuscire a proprio, um, collegandoci a quest'ultimo tema, um, coltivare un'educazione che sia basata sui valori e sulle emozioni e su che cosa vuol dire davvero essere umani. Questo spazio delle conversazioni vogliono essere davvero un, un luogo di scambio e avere tutti coloro i quali ci avete seguito, io ringrazio Adriano, Luca Magni che ci ha scritto, Federico Papa, Pando Bandù, eh, Silviana Aprile eh, che ci hanno seguito su, so, cito soltanto coloro che hanno commentato, Franca Pelucchi, Beatrice Della Nora, Simonetta Bar Bartorelli, Tullio Spadone, Luana Congedo. E Alessandra Agnecchi è veramente un piacere co poter costruire questa community online che, che, che conversi a me oggi è arrivato un messaggio è arrivato un messaggio da un amico che, 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 posso, che posso citare Giovanni Celerino che è l'hotel manager del, del Mandarin Hotel a Milano e mi, e mi ha scritto le conversazioni necessarie sono ossigeno in questo periodo sospeso ecco io spero che queste conversazioni per tutti quanti siano ossigeno ossigeno per pensare al mondo in una maniera diversa per cercare di prepararsi a guardare no, il presente e il futuro con degli occhi nuovi. Una volta usciti da qua, forse dovremmo farci tutti quanti un tampone. Escono da casa solo quelli che hanno progetti. Chi non ha progetti sta dentro casa, ok? Non esce, non ha il permesso di uscire. Allora, quello che, quello che stiamo cercando di fare è proprio questo, è seminare qualche cosa. Grazie oggi a Alec, grazie a Meg per la vostra generosità, per il tempo che ci avete dedicato. E il mondo, ci, ci mandate un messaggio, che il mondo è di coloro i quali hanno voglia, il mondo è degli imprenditori, di coloro i quali che però vogliono creare valori in una maniera diversa, forse avremo bisogno di più giovani in politica, Meg ti aspettiamo, e se non in politica a fare impresa, eh, Alec ti aspettiamo in Italia, non vediamo l'ora di averti più vicino, eh, ultima battuta, perché hai deciso di venire in Italia? Perché, perché che, scusa, potevi starti negli Stati Uniti, che fai in per, Italia? Perché è un anima italiano. <ride> Hai un'anima italiana. No, eh, perché sarà un momento di risvegliare, ci sarà un altro rinascimento. Io voglio essere dal primo giorno. Grazie Alec, grazie Meg, grazie per aver fatto parte di questo progetto e poi ci sentiamo per, appunto, per, per fare un po' il wrap up. Grazie ancora a tutti, grazie a quelli che ci hanno seguiti. Alla prossima che sarà mercoledì, quindi alle 17.30 con Patrizio Paoletti e Simona Gonella, tema e l'educazione sottotitolo ci abbiamo, abbiamo delle emozioni e abbiamo un cuore da coltivare. Ciao a tutti, grazie ancora. Grazie Alec. See you later. Grazie mille. Bye.